right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you all here for this uh, Aqua event, All Questions Answered. The reason we are doing this, uh, and we in this case, that's the Confederation of Laboratories for AI Research in Europe, also known as CLEAR. We do this because in many events, we would see experts discussing amongst themselves interesting questions related to AI, regulation, future plans, and so on. And then there is a few minutes for questions from the audience. And we think maybe we should try it the other way around with us not talking, but simply just answering the questions that you might possibly have. And that's what we're here for today. And therefore, we're gonna keep this very brief. Um, per answer, no more than one minute. And of course, we are experts in the area, but within one minute, we won't necessarily be able to give you comprehensive answers, but we hope to get through many interesting questions. With that said, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Holger Hoss, Professor of Machine Learning at Leiden University in the Netherlands, and also Chairman of the Board and one of the co-founders of CLEAR. I'm joined today by Jeroen van den Hoven, Philips Luzanek, and a little bit later, Peggy Falke from Keo Leuven will also join us. But please, Jeroen, introduce yourself, followed by Philip. Uh, Jeroen van den Hoven, I'm a professor of ethics and technology at Delft University of Technology. I'm editor-in-chief of a Spring and Nature journal called Ethics and Information Technology, and I'm an advisor to the European Commission in the European Group uh, on Ethics. Yeah, my name is Philip Zalek. I'm a professor at Saarland University and a scientific director uh, at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, the largest AI research, uh, independent research center worldwide. Um, we're bringing together AI, specifically trusted and um, uh, trusted and explainable AI, computer graphics, on the other hand, and high performance computing. And uh, I, I'm, uh, a, I was a member, like Jérôme, of the high-level expert group uh, advising the European Commission, and I'm also one of the co-founders um, of CLEAR and a member on the board of CLEAR. Great. Wonderful to have you both here, especially on relatively short notice. As you all know, last week um, there was an exciting event. Um, the European Commission announced its new plans on AI. Everybody will have heard uh, about this by now, probably. Um, lots of interesting things to come, and uh, we are hoping uh, to answer some of the questions you might have about that, about AI, or the future of AI in Europe, as envisioned by Claire. Um, and we hope to answer these questions over the next little while. So, let us see what uh, we can get in terms of questions. There is a bit of a lag between the YouTube feed um, and our recording here. That's just part of the technical setup. So we're gonna see how that goes. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, just so that you know nobody is getting bored, um, let's have a, a very short informal chat following the one minute rule already um, about the regulation. So, so maybe we'll start with you, Irun. So, so in one minute, can you, can you just share your feeling of this? I mean, you're, you're an expert in uh, ethics of technology, of course. Uh, can you just say for one minute um, what, what, you, what your reaction is to the Commission's announcements? Yeah, well, I, I think it's an excellent uh, initiative. It, is, it was to, expect, uh, to be expected. It was also announced, of course, uh, when this new commission, this geopolitical commission started, Ursula von der Leyen. And they basically, they wanted to do for AI what they had achieved uh, for uh, privacy and data protection. So what Europe has achieved is, is setting a global standard by means of European law and, and to be the first there and to, uh, to deal with all of the sensitive and ethical issues uh, as the European Parliament has also articulated and formulated, but without killing innovation. So it's uh, as it has uh, done uh, for privacy and giving, having given rise to a lot of research and also development in privacy enhancing, privacy respecting technology. The hope is, is that we can achieve the same for AI. So a lot of AI for good for all people uh, while uh, respecting the basic and constitutive values and ethical principles of the European Union. And I think that is, that's the sweet spot that, uh, that uh, the commission has been, been looking for. Great. Well, yeah, when you're setting a good example, I think 
that was exactly a minute. And as, uh, as if we had ordered it, we also have uh, the first question here. And uh, the question reads, give me just a second. In how far are the European AI initiatives affected by Brexit? And in how far can the UK profit from AI in order to overcome uh, the Brexit crisis? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm going to give this one uh, to Jeroen, if you accept it. Um, yeah, I, I, I can accept it. Um, so uh, I think um, uh, Britain has been been very amb ambitious, uh, ambitious in, in um, you know, also in the, the Turing uh, Institute and many uh, good universities in, 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 uh, in, in investing in, in, in research and development. Um, it was glad to leave the, uh, the, the Byzantine labyrinth of EU regulation behind uh, and is now seeking to, uh, to, to, to gain some advantage uh, there. Um, but uh, I think they will be uh, confronted with the same constraints that everyone who wants to do business and uh, in Europe uh, will be confronted with, which is this set of, of regulations that you have to comply for. And it's, it's, it, the, the, the regulation is very clear, it's very specific, very elaborate on, um, uh, on defining the obligations that anyone who wants to do business and wants to put into service or use or, or export or import uh, AI applications will have to uh, deal with. And there the time is up. Thank you very much, Jeroen. That was another uh, on-time arrival, shall I say. That's great. Um, let me see whether we have more questions coming in already. Not quite yet. So in this case, Philip, um, same question that I asked Jeroen before. What is your reaction to the European Commission's plans and announcements from last week? Yeah, I, I very much agree with what Jeroen said. It's, it's really... Um, as the first, in particular, big organization, big state, if you want, um, making a clear announcement of how we want to regulate AI going forward is a really an important step. And we've shown that uh, with GDPR, we, we ha have been leading and we will continue to be leading. That's, that's a very good development. Uh, but it is only a draft and there is a lot of topics to be discussed. The one thing that I applaud uh, drastically is, is really or important, really important is, is this focus on trust, uh, trust in AI. And, uh, but, but the way trust will be achieved, I think uh, there, we need to do much more than what is in, in the current proposal. This, this focus, for example, on high quality input data is certainly not enough. Um, Right? That doesn't guarantee that the output of an AI algorithm is as good as the input data. There's no guarantee of that. And we have good examples uh, uh, where, where that is not the case. So we need to do much more. We need, to, we need to focus on the outcome of the AI algorithm that this is within uh, whatever we want to regulate with whatever the rules, they need to focus on the output, not on the input. Very good, thank you, Philip. Um, we're still waiting for a few other questions from the audience coming in, but, but here is one that uh, I've noted down from uh, last week um, where we had about 120 questions that we couldn't actually answer. Um, and it struck me actually as, as a very interesting one. And, and that is, um, how can we actually ensure um, that innovation isn't stifled um, by the new regulation coming in? Um, now, now we heard, of course, um, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of, of talking about that, but uh, I also know that there's concern in the community and also in industry. Uh, and I'm wondering, Philip, uh, do you want to maybe uh, take a position on that? Because you work at the interface between industry and academia quite a bit in DFKI. So I'm sure you have your, your ear on the ground on this one. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a number of things that we need, we need to do there. I mean, certainly there need to be um, certain exceptions or lightning or sandboxes, however you want to call this, for, for research. We need to be able to do uh, experiments, to try out things, um, to uh, explore and, and also get evaluate wh whether certain approaches do work the way we, we expect them to be. And that's important for research, but this is also important to um, to at least within board bounds uh, explore business models. 
Um, so, so this is uh, important. That is already being uh, is, is already in the regulation to some degree. I think uh, that needs to probably be balanced a little bit more, and there will be probably a lot of discussion. And we see a lot of in, a lot of uh, interest from industry specifically um, on on these and and related rules. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Philip. Um, another question uh, that we have is, uh, what about the role of Central and Eastern Europe um, in, in all of this? Um, in, in terms of, you know, uh, the future of AI in the European Union, um, is, are, do they have an important role uh, to play in this? Or are they basically sort of, you know, second tier players um, that will, of course, come along because they're part of the union, but, uh, but cannot contribute right now very much to leadership? Um, so Jeroen, do you want to um, maybe take this one? No, I'll pass on that one. I think you're much more better qualified to answer that question. Actually. All right. Yeah, why I, don't think, I, I think Holger, why don't you take that yourself? Why don't take I this? Uh, why don't I take this one myself? Um, I mean, of course, I, I think they have a very important role to play. Um, I, I think um, this sort of uh, battle for talent that is going to play a decisive role in, in who's doing well in terms of AI globally and who isn't, um, that will to a large extent um, be decided by the degree to which we can mobilize the talent pool. And I think a large part of the talent pool actually for us uh, sits in, in Eastern, Central and also Southern Europe. So I believe it's, it's very important um, to take that seriously and to, to help um, our uh, uh, our friends uh, and colleagues over there um, to mobilize that talent pool. Um, so I think that's that's actually uh, very important for uh, also the plans that the commission has unveiled. Good. Yeah, it's it's also if I may just add to that, uh, there is the coordinated action plan, which which involves all of the countries um, also beyond the European Union. Indeed, precisely. Um, that brings me to the next question, and and that is you know. We already heard about the UK and, and uh, the situation there. Um, what, is, what is the opinion actually on, you know, should this be a European thing um, rather than maybe a global thing, right? Trustworthy AI, um, that, that shouldn't be just important for uh, Europe, that should, be, that should be important far beyond. Um, so rather than trying to regulate this in Europe and uh, trying to, you know, have leadership in Europe, shouldn't we actually go and, and build a much bigger alliance and, and do it there? Um, so let me see, Philip, do you want to uh, take this one? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I, I think we need to do one and not uh, leave out the other. I think we need to do both. There is, uh, I think, a very special interest that we have as Europeans. There's a background in values, uh, in, in the way we think in the tradition, the history of, of Europe, that we bring a very specific point of view to this. And, and we should be leading with this background. And so I think there is a specific European role that we're going to play. We should be playing, and hopefully we will be playing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not engaging with US and China and Canada and Japan and, and many, many others. Uh, we should be open there, and, and research is, of course, global, but I think there is something we specific we bring to the table. We should be proud of that. We should really focus on that part and trust uh, AI, trusted AI or the, the role of trust in AI, the roles of providing guarantees about the properties, uh, pro providing the rules that these guarantees need to uh, 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 oblige to. So all of those things uh, is, is something that is very much in the history of Europe. And, and this is, I think, where we can play a major role, a European role, and can be leaders globally. If I can add, uh, Holger, to, to that, and, and here the analogy with the GDPR is, uh, is, is striking. If you look at the history of how data protection uh, standards were set in the world, this, this all started uh, also in Europe and then got to the OECD and then exported to the, to the G20. And the same route has now very quickly been, been uh, traveled by this, uh, these the European ideas for, for regulation, going to the OECD and to, to the morally, co uh, morally willing uh, in, in the rest of the world, like Philip already mentioned, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan. Um, and uh, that, that's, uh, that's what the Commission is aiming for, and it will uh, actively 
uh, advocate these uh, these principles in the rest of the world and in its uh, inter interactions with uh, with uh, foreign foreign states. Absolutely. Very good. Um, here's another question that is uh, basically quite related to that, and and that is. Um, isn't it a little late for Europe to try and play catch up, especially with the United States and China when it comes to AI development? It seems that um, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, groundwork that has been done there over the past uh, few decades, actually, in terms of important companies, important investment. Um, is there even a point in trying to catch up in innovation um, or is the right way forward to focus on regulation uh, and, and leave it there? Um, so Philip, maybe I want to give this one to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I completely see this differently. Um, yes, of course, there is areas where companies like Google and others are are, are leading, um, but uh, the role of uh, AI in Europe is certainly um, very much at the front. Uh, if you look at papers, uh, where, where there's certainly a, a lot of value coming from Europe. Specifically, also, if you look at who is actually doing the work in the U.S., there is a lot of European, European educated experts, researchers, but also people in industry um, that are doing a lot of that work. We've lost a lot of talent uh, to that, and uh, we need to work on keeping that talent or bring, even bringing it back. Um, so, so all of this is, is really important. And um, again, I just wonder what I said earlier, there is a specific point of view that we have in Europe, and I think there is a large opening, a big gap that is not being filled right now, and there is a big role that we can play. There will certainly be areas where we will not be at the front, where others already are. We have to identify those and focus on the parts where we're really strong um, and, and, and not try to catch up everywhere. That doesn't make any sense. There, we have to identify and really uh, strengthen the part where we're strong already. And, and right. maybe add me to one one sentence to that for uh, industry. The minute, sorry, the minute. Is up, <laughs> okay. And we can have I have can I have a half a minute, Holger, on this? Yeah. You can have half a minute later, but now we have a question okay. that we need to get to you. Okay. So okay. maybe okay. let's make a. Okay. Let's, I'll roll uh, it into something else. Yeah. Promise. Exactly. Let's we we should probably add. So if people want to know more, just ask more questions in that. Direction. Exactly. That's the way. If you want to hear more than one minute about something, do ask a follow-up question. We'll be happy to address that. All right. So here's the question. Do we have the supervisory capacity at European and national levels to enforce proposed AI regulations of the European Commission? Um, and I think I want to give this one to Jeroen, if he's willing to take it. Yeah, I'm willing to do that. Um, perhaps our, our legal colleague who will join us later is even, even better equipped to do that, but I will, uh, I will have a go. Um, uh, I, I think uh, the, this, this regulation, this text already refers to existing uh, regulatory and, and supervising and monitoring uh, agencies that are in place. For example, it gives a, a, a fairly substantive place to the European Data Protection Supervisor as a kind of an overseer of, of, of many of these processes that they sketch out. Um, but they also uh, defer to many of the existing uh, national uh, organizations like uh, financial authorities that supervise and monitor the financial markets or uh, antitrust uh, or, uh, or privacy uh, uh, data protection officers. Um, so, but there will be uh, a need for a new type of, uh, of, of, of monitoring and supervising uh, authority. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, it has to be created. Yeah, it has to be created, like like the the, the on a, on an, uh, the, this board uh, AI board on a European level has to be created. All right, thank you, Jeroen. Um, here is the next question: What is the required intelligence level of a method to be denoted as AI? Couldn't a more critical discussion of intelligence overcome the issue? that people tend to be scared by a super intelligence. Philip, um, maybe you take yeah. that first? I, I, I can. Um, so th there is this huge discrepancy between the AI that uh, people are scared about, which mostly come, I would argue, from Hollywood and uh, movies of, of the kind that you all know. Um, right, um, where we were, and, and then there are books about uh, similar di directions. Um, 
uh, this, this is far, far away from where we are. And if we only could do a small part of that, um, I guess there would be a couple of, of, of big awards, um, which we don't have. There's a long way to go until we even come close to this, if we, if we ever will. Uh, on the other hand, people uh, in the general public uh, completely underestimate the capabilities and the possibilities, the opportunities that AI offers to our real world and specifically this idea of injecting AI into existing business, which is something that I think we need to focus on in Europe much more than, than uh, let's say Google focusing on, on creating new AI, uh, uh, not just Google, but also the US focusing on creating AI companies specifically on AI. I think we are much stronger in, in adding AI to existing technologies. Um, and and uh, there is a huge value in, in that. And we need to, but we need to be better uh, prepared to bring this, to communicate this. Uh, there is a big gap between the fear and what, uh, what the benefits are. There, and that's something we need to do in Claire um, and, and, but also in general. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Um, Follow-up question on this one. Um, what is AI in the first place? Seems that different organizations and people have very different ideas what they even mean when they say AI. If you don't mind, maybe I'm going to take this I one myself. Suggesting. Um, yes. I think that, of course, is, is an insightful observation <laughs> that is doubtlessly true. And if I may add, uh, has been true from the very beginning. However, um, there is one standard that we have for intelligence, and that's human intelligence. Um, as Philip just said, you know, we're not going to get, and it's, it's doubtful to me that we should aim to get at sort of broadband, um, fully comprehensive human level intelligence, but we know the kind of tasks that take human intelligence to solve, right? And I think the most reasonable definition is um, anything that you do with a machine that for a human requires intelligence to do, subjectively speaking, falls within the scope of AI. And that includes reasoning tasks. It of course includes learning. It includes also interaction with one another, with other intelligent beings, um, be they artificial or natural. So when we talk about AI, of course, and we have agents, software agents, they also need to talk to each other, right? And that requires a certain level of intelligence. Uh, it's, you know, optimizing things, figuring out, prob solving problems, all this falls within uh, the realm of AI. And I think there was my minute indeed. Very good. Um, moving along, here is a question uh, related to Claire. Uh, Claire prides itself uh, by uh, to have influenced the European Commission um, in their plans for AI in Europe. Can you make more specific um, where that influence can be seen and what evidence you have that, that this is actually true? So maybe I'm going to give this one um, to Philip, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. Well, there, there's a couple of things, right? If you look um, at the original vision document that we published at uh, as Claire. This was kind of our coming out with that vision document that's almost three years old by now. Um, and if you look at the main points there that we, uh, that we strive to achieve or that we propose as goals, um, then essentially all of them are in the white paper by the commission that was uh, published recently um, and, and also uh, where there was a lot of skepticism, let's say in the beginning, and we had long discussions in the high level expert group was this idea uh, of, a, of a clear hub or what the commission now, which, which is also now in, in the white paper, which the commission there calls a lighthouse center. Um, th that is in the white paper. There is uh, discussions, strong discussion going on there. We're working on actually uh, working out the details uh, and, and coming up with proposals, a proposal for that. Uh, there is even a call for projects uh, about defining this lighthouse center, uh, an upcoming call. So, so yes, so that is something that very clearly comes from Claire and is being worked on uh, actively uh, going forward. Thank you, Philip. Uh, what can we learn from the implementation process of the GDPR regulation for the implementation of the proposed EC regulation? Um, and is there any overlap? 
Jeroen, I think that falls sort of somewhere close mm -hmm. to your domain, given that we don't yep. have Peggy here yet, who, yep. for whom this might also be good, right? But, but maybe you can give us a try. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think, first of all, the, the devil is in the details, right? It, it, uh, we have learned from uh, that, that, it, it, that it's a very difficult and uh, kind of slow process to, to really implement this. Um, and, um, but, uh, and, and also, for example, um, the devil is in the details, for example, uh, with respect to rights to access data or to, to, to get your data, um, you really have to pay to it attention to, uh, you know, how people will be able to, uh, to do that or to get their data and, and to invest in, in the techniques that, that will allow them to do and also do surveys and to see in how successful uh, this is. Um, uh, the other thing is, is that um, I think an important lesson is, is, is that it's about um, open norms and open uh, concepts. There are, there are a lot of you know, sufficient documentation, su sufficient care being taken of you know, curating data sets and, and, and keeping uh, log files on, on, on this, that, and the other. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, it is um, to a large extent also a matter of the responsibility of all the actors uh, involved in these ecosystems. Um, and, and therefore it is not just a matter of, um, of, of reading this and being in compliance and getting your rubber stamp. It's a matter of doing your philosophical and ethical homework. You have to think through things per sector, per, uh, per domain, uh, application domain, what is, uh, what is needed. Great, thank you very much, Jeroen. Um, here is another question that's actually quite fascinating. And this one is, is about data and it goes like this. Uh, considering that big tech, uh, notably Google, has been collecting a lot of data that is considered invaluable for machine learning type activities, uh, is there any chance that European competitors uh, could actually uh, meaningfully compete on data? Um, Philip, do you want to take this one? Happy to do that. Um, yes, of course, these huge um, uh, social networks, there's a lot of data about people uh, in there. Um, but this is also data that times out quickly. Um, people change, uh, a lot of the data changes, and uh, there is a lot of pushback now, not just in Europe, but also in the US itself, uh, about that this way of, of controlling and gathering data um, is probably not being accepted even in the US. Um, so that will that business model is actually under threat now and that's probably a good thing. On the other hand, uh, specifically in Europe, uh, we focus much more and it's all, that's also a good thing on on data from machines, from manufacturing processes. Um, and, and, and there we have a huge advantage. Um, the, the partially that industry doesn't exist or it's not digitized in the US. Um, so uh, there, there is a huge value in the data that is there. We, but uh, on the other hand, we're, we're not yet tapping into that data as much as we should. And that should probably be one of the priorities of going forward, both on the technical side, but also on the uh, regulation and uh, the industry side of how to implement that. Good, thank you. Uh, there is a question about uh, whether there are specific areas in which Europe might be able to do well in terms of competing in AI, uh, especially with respect to also having sufficient data that we can learn from. Um, if you don't mind, maybe I'm going to take this one. Yeah. Um, Philip has already just mentioned uh, one of these areas, and, and that is uh, anything that has to do with uh, Industry 4.0, um, machinery, and so on. Uh, that certainly is an important area in which Europe also has, uh, has a bit of leadership, of course. Uh, I think another area that I personally find very exciting is, of course, health and medicine, right? Yeah. This is an area where a lot of the data is, is highly sensitive. Um, and it's, it's an area where I think people will greatly care to not give their data up easily to, for instance, a big American company, right, or US-based company. Um, so in that sense, if we get our act together in Europe um, to collect this data in a reasonable and trustworthy way and, and learn from it, uh, maybe in a privacy pr preserving way, um, we probably have, uh, in my opinion, at least a, a chance to do things 
that mm -hmm. Google, for example, could, could not do because people wouldn't trust them with the data. All right. Um, at this point, we've been doing fairly well with answering lots of questions within the one limit, uh, minute limit. Uh, actually, I can say this is hard work. Huh? <laughs> Jeroen okay. and, and Philip, that must be hard work for you too, but you're doing amazingly well. Um, yeah, also, also, like sometimes you want to answer it, it there's the urge to really answer it and, and augment to that, but uh, we'll work that out. But it, it keeps things moving, right? So that's, that's yeah, pretty it, nice. It is uh, a nice format. To, Exactly. To our audience here, you know, keep the questions coming. Also, follow up questions. If anything you hear in an answer, you want to question further or, you know, to push against, uh, that's, that's a good thing to do. Um, you can reach us through the YouTube chat, of course. You can also tweet at us um, or use any other means to get the information uh, to us at Claire. Alexa is monitoring, so uh, we, we very likely won't uh, miss your question. We are also, of course, still looking forward to having uh, Peggy Falke hopefully come in and join us for this little session uh, very soon now. She had another appointment before and therefore uh, couldn't make it uh, earlier. Um, so let's move on uh, to another question here. Uh, and, and this one um, is, is about uh, the automotive industry. Um, maybe somebody from Germany, I don't know. Um, so, so the question goes like, uh, we've seen how within very short time, uh, an American company, Tesla, has been able to you know, take a leap forward um, in, uh, in the automotive space, uh, much to the chagrin of, uh, of the uh, European uh, automotive industry. Um, isn't that evidence that we shouldn't feel so safe in the industry that we feel Europe has the lead on, even in the age, and specifically in the age of AI? Philip, I think that's a question that's that's almost perfectly Probably. made for you. No, so do you want to take that one? Probably, yeah, yeah, happy. But Tesla is the completely wrong example. Um, I, there was just a statement by by the Waymo guys who who said that the level of autonomous driving by by Tesla is about where they have been ten years ago, uh, or something to that order, if I remember correctly. Um, so, and, and they're, they're apparently just killed two people. They claiming the, auto, the, the autonomous driving wasn't active, but apparently there at least some degree was active. Anyway, uh, uh, on the other hand, you see that uh, in their home turf, Tesla, uh, Volkswagen is making tremendous progress on the uh, electric drive uh, cars, vehicles. Um, it's unclear where the, um, what is the actual difference on, on autonomous, uh, autonomous driving between them. There's this huge problem that we see is Tesla, it's, they have to go out there early to show what they can have. Um, and they can even take the, 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 the danger of, of dead people. A Volkswagen cannot do that. And so they have to be more careful. Let, let, I leave it at this, but it should be clear where we're coming from. So it's, it's not entirely clear where the difference is, but it's not as big as it's being perceived. Certainly Very not. good. Quite a few more questions coming in. Um, here is uh, yeah. the first of them. Europe wants to lead on regulation. Will Europe be able to lead on innovation? That to me sounds like something that Jeroen might have uh, yep. uh, an Happy expert opinion that. on. Yeah, well, I think it's important to bear in mind that uh, uh, that we have to qualify this notion of innovation. You know, compare with uh, what happened in, in in clean tech and renewable energy in the in the kind of sustainability area. So there we we had let's say societal or ethical goals. We said we wanted a specific type of innovation, not just any anything. And we saw an incredible surge, an incredible boom. Of, of, of Europe grown innovations and new technologies and solutions to the sustainability problem. That is because we, uh, we, we wanted a particular type of innovation. So, so the same applies here. We want a particular type of innovation. That is what we want. We want smart solutions in the AI digital space for the problems that we have in healthcare, in education, in research, in, in well, there's a stock list of the UN sustainable development goals basically. Right. And uh, we don't want, you know, another 7.0, 8.0 marginal increase in functionalities. We want radical, interesting solutions for our societal problems. That's the type of innovation. And that is what this uh, regulation hopes to achieve. 
Thank you. Um, next question. What is needed to boost industrial AI in the EU? And is it a good thing that the European Commission wants to focus on excellence in this field? So this field being industrial AI. Uh, Philip, this seems to be directed at you, I think. At least uh, I'd like to offer it to you. Yeah, yeah, happy to, to, to take it. Um, first of all, excellent is absolutely needed. We need breakthroughs in that area. Um, actually, autonomous driving is, is a prime example. I, I would argue we can technically do, we, we can do autonomous driving to a large degree. Uh, Tesla wanted, to, uh, Waymo wanted to have 60, 80,000 cars on the, uh, on the streets three years ago. It's not there. What's the reason? It's not the technical reason. It, it is that we cannot trust the technology. And that is something I think fundamentally something we can bring forward here in Europe. And if in particular, this also applies to industrial AI. If we cannot provide reliable technology where we, where who, whoever wants to implement it in industry can rely on that this does this thing and it will not mess up and they will not have liabilities beyond whatever whatever happens after this. There is no life uh, life on danger uh, on, on the line and, and others just because we're using AI. That is where we come from. I'm fully with Jérôme here. Um, we need the right kind of technology, not just any innovation. Thank you, Philip. Um, next question: What about the extremely large computational infrastructures that are needed for deep learning-based AI? Is Europe competitive on this side? Maybe I take this one if it's okay with you guys. Um, yeah, that's uh, it's it's an excellent question, and quite honestly, I think currently we're not really ready. There is investment uh, at the European level uh, in HPC. Uh, and that is very important, but the HPC requirements for AI are different, not just in terms of GPUs and deep learning, but also in terms of the degree to which you can control the computational environment for many types of AI applications, and more needs to be done there. And that is actually one of the reasons why Claire has been pushing very hard from the beginning for dedicated large-scale AI infrastructure. That's why we and Claire believe the European uh, union and its associated countries should have the uh, ambition to build something um, at the scale of a of the world's best accelerator in terms of supercomputing dedicated for AI. So when we say we want a CERN for AI, at the core of that CERN, we want the computational and data infrastructure that can be number one in the world and that can only really that that can meaningfully compete with companies like Google. Okay. Um, next question, um, may it happen that an excess of regulations causes, the Euro causes European AI to be uncompetitive with respect to other countries, USA, USA, China, and others? That's similar to a question we had before, but Jeroen, I think that gives you a great opportunity to expand your views on this uh, beyond the one minute you had earlier. So please, um, yeah. will you take this? And, it, and, and it, uh, it is related to the discussion that, uh, that we just uh, had, or the answers to the question we just had. Uh, I think, of course, an excess is, is, is never good when it becomes really unwieldy and Byzantine, a labyrinth of, of, of uh, and high cost and high information and transaction costs. That's, that's never good. Um, but um, a, a smart regulation, as we've seen with, uh, with, with GDPR and also requirements for safety that we see, uh, Europe is, is very strong on food safety, et cetera, to the chagrin of, uh, of, of people in, in the US. Um, and it's often perceived as a trade barrier instead of a kind of a principled uh, a, a approach. But uh, I think um, you know this 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 document that we're now looking at is is a very good starter for a smart regulation, which is you know for example the annexes of these high risk applications. It's an open open. Uh, so it starts with a limited set of of high risk uh, applications, uh, and, and then it's open to add more in the future. Right. So that that's that's the kind of flexibility you want. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I have a feeling that Peggy is about to join us uh, in just she a just, moment. This is, this is great. I, she just joined. Oh yeah, fantastic. Yes. Hello, Peggy. Very good to see you. 
I'm mm. sometimes looking at our own YouTube feed um, just to see whether things are going okay there. And that's a little delayed. Um, but now I'm looking at you live uh, and our viewers should see you about now as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so before we take the next questions, would you like to take a minute to introduce yourself? Happy to do so. First of all, apologies for being so late due to conflicting uh, meetings. I'm Peggy Valke, Professor of Law and Technology at KU Leuven. Uh, the research center to which I'm affiliated is the Center for IT and IP Law. So as the name it says itself, we're focusing on information technology law and intellectual property law. And we're also um, interacting or working closely together with the broader institute on AI at KU Leuven called leuven.ai, uh, as well as with IMEC. Very good. Thank you, Peggy. It's really wonderful to have you here. And of course, we knew about your conflict and we thought it would be very much worthwhile having you even just for the last 20 minutes or so. So thanks for joining us. Um, there are a few more questions queued up here. Uh, I'm going to read the first of these. How should Europe achieve dense um, AI innovation ecosystems? Peggy, is that something you would like to offer an opinion on? Well, by providing a clear legal framework, <laughs> <laughs> the question is not... Um... Uh, well, it's not in directly uh, linked to my expertise, but I think what is important is to have yeah, uh, both investments as well as legal certainty. So um, yeah, that's my short answer to it. Thank you very much. And a follow-up question here is, um, is there a feeling that the investment part is as well developed as the regulation part in last Wednesday's announcements? And I saw Philip already sort of making a little hand signal. So maybe Philip, I'm going to give this to you because I, I think I know that you have an opinion on that one. <laughs> yeah, very much do. Um, yeah, not so much about the, the regular, the, the announcement by the commission, but in general, I think that is one of the areas where we need to develop dramatically more in, in, in Europe. There's still a huge gap between research and, and industry and, and really bringing these two things together. I mean, one of the, the secrets of, of Silicon Valley is that industry engages very early with research. Uh, sorry, industry yeah, is, is engaging early with research. Uh, they're taking risk to, to get access to, er, to uh, research at a very early stage. Um, and that is something that we don't have a good tradition here in Europe, um, we, which we need to develop much, much further. And that money is not the only element here. It certainly helps, but um, we need a change in minds, uh, both on the research side, but also on the industry side. Uh, DFKI, we have this concept of a transfer lab where we actually bring people from industry into our research lab so we can actually work directly also on fundamental research, not just on, the, uh, on throwing the latest results over the fence to, to the industry side, but really engage even with, with basic research early on. And, and I think that's a key element. But I, I fully agree with Peggy that the legal aspects and the a level playing field for everyone is, is a key element of that. And that plays more to the regulation side. Very good, thank you, Philip. Here's a question that I think is basically directed at Peggy. So, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna prioritize this a bit. Isn't the commission's document an attempt at regulating something they can't define? Peggy, what's your, what's your feeling on that? So this goes, I think, to the, to the question, you know, is the definition of AI in there precise enough that, you know, it can even be regulated uh, the way they intend to? Uh, well, first of all, there is not a definition of AI as such, but of AI systems. And that's an important difference. Um, I'm very... Yeah, very much. Sorry? Sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> um... Uh, so, is it sufficiently precise? There will undoubtedly be discussion about the definition and it might be further fine-tuned. In any case, I think it's a very good start. Um, and there are so many pieces of uh, legislation where definitions are not crystal clear and are further developed as the rules are implemented and interpreted by courts example that I know quite well in the media and an electronic communications network, an electronic communications service, 
Um, it was clear in the old days. It became less clear when over the top players came to the fore. Is that also an electronic communication service and what, what the WhatsApps and, uh, of this world offer? Um, so, uh, I think it's a good uh, start. It might be further fine tuned, but uh, don't let us stop from um, introducing rules because the definition is perhaps not 100% crystal clear because there is no absolute certainty, especially not in law. Great, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, let me see, there is a few more questions here. Uh, let's take this one next. Um, is it wise for the commission to abandon the AI-driven consumer market for the B2 exclamation point market? So I think that's the B2B market perhaps. Um, I don't know if whoever asked that question could clarify we misunderstood it, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take it as such. Philip, do you want to take this one? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there, we, we kind of talked about this already, right? Um, there is the much more uh, strong focus on, on industry and medical uh, um, research um, or medical applications um, that uh, probably will play a dramatically more important role here in, in, in Europe going forward. Um, I, I'm not sure we've given up on, on uh, personal information side of things um, and the, 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 the business to consumer market, uh, but it's certainly an area where we, there would be a lot more competition um, with, if we look in the US and, and other places. So. Um, again, we should focus on our strength, and they are certainly you know, more in the other area than, than, um, than the uh, business to consumer area. Okay, and I just see confirmation that indeed uh, we have read this uh, question correctly. Uh, there's a bunch more in here, so let me see which one we deal with next. Um, yeah, this one seems interesting. Um, where should the lighthouse ideally be located? And that, of course, refers to the concept that the European Commission also has prominently in their updated coordinated action plan and to the thing that Claire has been uh, advocating uh, since 2018, namely a big European hub for AI uh, with, with hefty uh, infrastructure and, and also great staff and a great working environment. So um, maybe I'm gonna take this one if it's okay with everybody else. Um, so th there's often this argument that, you know, we can't have a centralized hub because we can never decide where this would be. And I think uh, that's a bogus argument. Um, you know, I'm sure that when they planned CERN, they had the same discussions and they figured it out in the end because they had to. When they decided where the European Central Bank had to go, um, they had to figure that out as well. And, and they did, um, right? And, and with a lot of other things, it's, it's exactly like that. So, so these problems can be solved. Um, the question I think is not so much where should it be located, but which criteria should drive the choice, right? And there, I would really hope that it's not just sort of some political game that is being played. You know, for instance, um, as you heard me say earlier, I, I'm all for supporting Eastern Europe very strongly, but I think it would be wrong to say because Eastern Europe doesn't have a big European piece of infrastructure yet, uh, it needs to go there, right? I think that's the wrong kind of argument. We have to look at what would make this thing a success, right? And And then, choose the location to maximize that. And I think there are many factors like that. One of them is, is the place attractive? One of them, is it easy to reach? Uh, a third is, is it, is it, uh, does it have a good um, AI infrastructure around it in terms of you know, companies um, uh, and, and good universities and so on? Um, and there I'm out of time. So the follow-up question to that was, how much funding would be appropriate and required for a lighthouse center? Um, Philip, do you want to take that one, perhaps? I, I think this is uh, the, the, these questions we have to answer later. Um, the, and, and you kind of alluded to that already, right? We first have to define exactly what that Lighthouse Center is, what kind of research we will uh, do there, how this will be structured, and uh, many, many other uh, questions that we have to work out first. Um, but the point is, uh, very clearly that we need to do something that is large, that has impact. Um, and that will be considerable, that will be expensive uh, by no means. Uh, the key element that I think we need to focus on in, in such a center is also 
the cross-sectorial um, aspects of AI. AI is the first technology where, right, you don't want to keep things local to something. You, the, the, the more data you can get access to, the better the AI algorithm, at least many AI algorithms, uh, can work to. So you want to have this cross-sectorial uh, communication um, and, and we want trust for that. And that is hard to do. And there, that could be one of the key elements, for example, and, and you need a lot of computer infrastructure, but a lot of different aspects uh, of AI algorithms for this as well. Okay, good. Uh, so here I'm gonna uh, try and help a little further to the question, to the, pers uh, to the person who asked the question. Um, Philip, come on, give us a number. Give us, give us a number, um, what would be required in terms of one-time investment and then annual investment to make something uh, like you've been advocating, advocating also from the very beginning to make something like this work, just a ballpark. It has to start smaller. We have to build it. We, don't, we can't start with the full thing. But in towards the end, um, we're certainly talking several hundreds of millions of euros that will go into that. I should say this is not that there will be the, um, the, the, the researchers will be located there. Um, they will be there for a time to do projects and things like that. This center will be included into a network of hubs, um, of, of, of centers of excellence in, in all of the regions in Europe. So it's not that there is a center in uh, so it's in, in opposition to, to, to the rest of the AI community, but it's really like the center of that. It's tightly integrated with that. And that money at the end comes to the benefit of the entire community, not just on the research side, but also in the industry side. And I see a lot of investment should also come from, from industry. And, and if we do a good job, they want to, they should want to in, uh, invest into that center as well. Um, maybe that's a first answer to that. All right, great. I've heard people talk about, you know, something like uh, a budget comparable to that of CERN. Um, that would be a billion a year. Um, to me, actually, that sounds about right. And it's not yeah. far off from what you just said, Philip. Um, here's plenty more questions. Um, Peggy, I have at least two lined up for you, but there's one direct follow on on the lighthouse. So if you permit me, I'm going to um, do this first. Um, and then we get uh, to the questions that I think uh, you will be in an excellent position to answer. Um, so uh, the commission sometimes talks about a distributed lighthouse these days. Um, what does the commission mean by that? Um, isn't that just <laughs> another network? Um, Jeroen, I'm, I'm curious whether you might have an opinion on that one. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a, very much like a, like a network uh, approach. And um, yeah, you, you find a lot of these, these, uh, these solutions uh, in Brussels, of course. Um, I, I fully agree with Philip and, and with yourself that uh, I think um, uh, we already have these networks and Claire is a, is a wonderful example of, of, the, of these networks. And now we need a place where, it, where for maximum impact. And uh, so I, I, would, I would love to stay away a little bit from, from that being the dominant uh, conception of what we need in, in Europe. But we need this Great. as well. We need it as well, we need it as well, yeah. Good, thank you both. Uh, so now let's come to the questions that uh, to me uh, should very likely go to Peggy. Um, what will happen to the proposed regulation during the decision-making process in the following years? Peggy, do you want to take that one? <clears throat> Absolutely, let me look for my uh, glass bowl. <laughs> no, I don't know if this is a question about procedure in terms of what will happen now. Uh, to that, I can give you an answer. So if this is now on the table of the Council of Ministers on the one hand and the European Parliament on the other hand, um, at different, different um, uh, sections within the European Parliament will take a look at it. Uh, there will be one lead committee and then the several other committees that provide opinions. And both of those organs, because the European Union actually has three uh, limbs uh, to the legislative power, which is the commission putting a proposal on the table. And then the Council of Ministers on the one hand, the European Parliament discussing that 
And once they've made up their minds, uh, bring that together. And then what we call the trilogue negotiation starts, uh, where the opinion of the parliament, the opinion of the council goes back to the commission. The commission comes up with a new proposal, takes into account those opinions, and then it's discussed again, uh, probably, uh, because it would be very surprising if the European Parliament would adopt this text as such in what we call first reading. When it comes to the, so that's the procedural question. That's an easy one. Uh, when it comes to substance, what will change? Honestly, I have no idea. Uh, undoubtedly, there some provisions will be tweaked further, um, but I have no idea to in what direction that will go. Okay, and there the clock also saves you from having to speculate too much. So sometimes this one minute uh, limit can be, uh, can be pretty good. Huh? <laughs> yes. There is a follow up question, however. Um, how much resistance can we expect from industry um, and or national governments? Uh, Peggy, do you want to take this or would you rather um, pass on it and give it to somebody else? I can give a quick answer. Um... There will be some resistance, undoubtedly, at the same time, we've all heard, um, well, actually from the big tech companies, a call for legal certainty, legal clarity. Um, there, I'm also quite active at the level of the Council of Europe, yeah, which established also an ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence to uh, examine whether we should have a European <clears throat> treaty, yeah, so which would have a broader coverage than the European Union because the Council of Europe has 47 members. And everybody, there was a big concern, um, is this going to succeed? And then at some point there was a relief, or even the tech industry is calling for clear rules uh, because uh, some uh, do no longer provide certain technologies to certain actors because they think it's unethical. It would be better if we were all on the same page and we knew very clearly what is prohibited, what is high risk and hence comes with additional obligations. So um, I'm, I'm not expecting to be honest, resistance to such an extent that this will again be put into the shelf. Good, thank you very much. Um, I know that Philip has a pretty hard cutoff, but Philip, here is a last question that perhaps you could take. Yeah. Um, is there a concrete strategy on how to bring AI and CS understanding to kids and young adults? Uh, that oh. is AI assisting in digital learning and resources provided for getting more CS teachers in schools, things along those lines. Can you take that? I can give it a try. Um, there, there's, that's something for the long haul, of course, right? Uh, but um, we need to attack this along the entire spectrum from early childhood to have technical understanding as early as possible in the schools to really educate people in the workforce uh, on, on AI technology and everything in between. Um, there is there's a big undertaking. There's a lot of stuff that is happening. I mean, there's, there's the, um, the, the, the Finnish uh, course uh, on AI that is widely popular is being distributed. There's a lot of other resources. There's a lot of online stuff really uh, uh, from, from various uh, 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 companies and, and other organizations online. I think this will help dramatically, but it needs much more support also by, by the government uh, for, for educational purposes. We need to train people, not so much on the specific AI algorithm, but on the understanding of what AI actually is, um, what, to, what, what is realistic, what is not, what to look out for in AI and what we, the public, the, the average person needs to understand about this technology and what, what it brings and the, the advantages, but also the dangers of the technology. It, it always has both sides of that. And, and there's a lot of investment we need to do in, in, in this. And, and this is underestimated and underfunded right now, dramatically. And at this point, I sorry, I have to leave at this point uh, with the follow-up. No worry, Philip. No that was a lot it. of fun, let me say. I'm happy to great, come back. Great to have you. Um, so the rest of us will take, maybe if it's okay, two more questions or so, and then we can call it, uh, then we can go into the weekend, uh, feeling that we've done a good job. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Um, so, so follow-on question here. Is it reasonable to cover AI content uh, in schools? Or should that start at the university level? Um, so I'm curious, Jeroen, do you want to 
share your personal opinion on that one? <clears throat> Um, I'll try. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, for any, anything digital, I think it would be really good if we started very early on. So that as not very specific to AI, but I think the sooner uh, you, you, you're able to, uh, to, to, to make children aware and to get them you know, in touch with the basics of, uh, of what's happening in this uh, in digital society around them, uh, the better it is. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, I mean, the view of the European Commission is also uh, very much in, in, uh, in this direction, that, uh, that uh, sensible solutions and sensible regulation require an educated population, broadly speaking. So that, uh, and, and I know that they will be investing a, a lot in, in, this, uh, in this space. Otherwise, the whole idea of, of uh, inclusion, participation, consultation, which is a very uh, important ingredient in, in every European approach to a, a, a difficult societal problem wouldn't fly. Okay, thank you very much. Peggy, there's one last question for you, if you have the time and energy to take it. Are you in? Absolutely. Awesome. So here's the question. Shouldn't the regulation have been regulation of technology systems rather than AI systems? If, techno if the technologies do the same, one using AI, the other not, then one is regulated and the other not. Is that the way it should be? That's a good question. Um, because there is indeed, and, and this is a point of criticism um, in, in the current proposal that the AI system provision in the, in the text itself does not refer to specific technologies, but then there's an annex in which specific technologies are mentioned. I guess this is the compromise that the European Commission tried uh, or tries to strike between being uh, sufficiently neutral and future proof on the one hand by having the text itself sufficiently broad and then provide sufficient clarity by providing further details in this annex. You can criticize that, but it's, um, you need to strike a balance uh, between being future proof on the one hand and being sufficiently clear with pointing out what you mean. Um, are there non-AI systems, so to speak, that do the same thing as, um, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm a little surprised by that question because I thought that what is so specific about what we call now AI systems is their autonomy, their adaptiveness, and that that is what uh, sets what we call AI aside and, and also what creates uh, the concerns or that has given rise to the concerns that, that are now um, well, led to this, to this proposal to, to regulate certain aspects of, of the use and the implementation and the putting on the market of these uh, systems. So if you don't have the same risk or the same concerns over these other, but the question was what if they lead to the same concerns shouldn't then they also be included? Yeah. Um, yes, but I guess then you probably also would name them AI systems or not? <laughs> All right. So, um, Fair yeah. enough. I, I, I see know that we are in a circular um, <laughs> reasoning now, but... Um, Indeed. Yeah. It's, it's tricky, right? I mean, to, to define uh, AI by its behavior, it's, it's of course tricky, right? Um, I guess the commission will have to fight with that one as well in parliament. Um, I just see that Alexa, um, just before you took this question, um, said last chance to get your question answered and then we got one more. So if it's okay with you, let's answer this one last question and that's it then, right? Then we have all deserved our weekend for sure. Um, it's, I think it's a very interesting question. How exactly are the EU and Claire planning on eventually joining forces with other AI initiatives, for example, in China or the US? Um, I find that interesting because it, it harkens back to a question that we had earlier before you joined, actually, Peggy. Isn't that something that should be done globally rather than sort of based in Europe or spearheaded in Europe? So if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to take this one because I think there is a beautiful and simple answer to it. And that is, Claire, as it stands right now, is already um, reaching out beyond Europe, right? Certainly beyond the EU. Uh, we have prominent members in Switzerland, in Norway, and of course now in the UK outside of the EU, but also far beyond. We have associate members in Brazil, in, uh, in the US, 
um, in China, I don't think currently, um, but in Canada, so, so certainly we have reached beyond and we, we, we feel this is very important because it gives even more diversity of perspective. And of course, uh, it gives even more firepower to what we try to achieve. Um, the second thing I'd, I'd say is that, that many of the organizations that we think are role models for us, notably CERN and ESA, are also Europe-based organizations that have many members outside of Europe and they work very well that way. The third thing I would say is that the EU, of course, is reaching out through some of its member states and uh, something called the Global Panel on AI, GPI, uh, and the G7 um, to connect with other countries. Notably, uh, Canada and France have been spearheading this and uh, both Claire and the Commission themselves are pretty hooked into that. So I think we don't have to be afraid that we will follow some sort of an isolationist European approach in this, um, because clearly AI is there to help with global problems. So there should be global participation and global cooperation in this area as well. So with this, let's wrap it up. Um, thank you, Jeroen. Thank you, Peggy, for joining today and for playing this game. Um, it's been amazing how much ground we covered in these questions. Uh, I didn't keep track, but uh, I think we must have answered 30, 40, maybe even more. Uh, so, so that's pretty good. Uh, thanks also to Philip, who isn't uh, here any longer because he had to leave. Thanks to Alexa, who did uh, a lot of support work uh, in the back and the Claire team that uh, made this pilot possible. Um, and thanks for everybody, to everybody in the audience that um, asked really interesting questions. Hopefully our one minute answers um, could satisfy your curiosity and bring you a little bit further uh, in your interest uh, for these important topics. So with this, uh, let's have a good evening and a very good weekend. Uh, enjoy the 1st of May, which is a holiday in many European countries and look forward to seeing you again.